My name is Chelsea Leffitt. Um, I am a senior vice president with HVS and I'm a board member of the Northeast chapter for the International Luxury Hotel Association. Um, the Northeast chapter, we've created this webinar series to be basically a platform for hoteliers and industry participants to examine opportunities and reinvention or to analyze recovery options and profitability strategies for the hotel industry during this time. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our second in our series. Last week was our first one. And today we'll be discussing um, the hotel financing and transaction environment. I will be moderating today's session again. And with me, I have panelist Deborah Friedland. She is the managing director with Eisner Amper. I have Kathy Conroy, Senior Managing Director of HVS and Practice Leader of the Shared Ownership Service for HVS. Fernando Muellet, the Executive Vice President and Chief Development Officer for Playa Hotels and Resorts. And Rudy Rudel Huber, Managing Director with Hodges Ward Elliott on with me. Um, and today's webinar is brought to you by Elevon, which is a subsidiary, subsidiary, sorry, excuse me, of U.S. Bank and one of the leading providers of the payment solutions for lodging industry. Uh, before we start the panel session, Carrie, the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Hospitality for Elevon, is going to briefly talk to us about their product and how it can assist hotels in the future. Carrie, do we have you on the line? Yes, thank you. Great. So th there's going to be a lot of changes uh, made by the lodging industry to adapt to the COVID-19 outbreak. So today, I would just like to take a few minutes to focus on two key changes in how payments are going to be or will be transacted in our new normal. So in slide number one, um, we have uh, what to do for touchless payment experience. And you ask yourself, uh, what does that look like? What is a touchless payment experience? Uh, there's a lot of buzzwords out there um, in the last probably three months that talk about touchless or contactless. What does that actually mean? Um, so on here, there are a few different scenarios, uh, and there's many forms of, of touchless or, or contactless payments, as you can see, that are listed on the slide. However, you know, coming out of COVID-19, hotels are going to need to be prepared to provide a contactless environment where they're able. And also, guests are now more sensitive than ever to a cleanliness and sanitization effort. Um, but we also want to limit the amount of touch, touchless surfaces or touch surfaces um, that the guest and or employee would encounter. Uh, during uh, either the employee during the normal course of work or the guest uh, for their stay. In some jurisdictions, like California, there are mandates now that businesses who accept in-person payments, such as hotels, must clean and sanitize the payment device after every use. Um, so offering a touchless payment experience is more convenient for both the, guest, the guests and also the employees. So considerations for a no-touch experience are, there's multiple as you can see, um, so you might have different flavors of this in, in your environment and that's why it's really important to, to, to look at the environment holistically. Uh, there's EMV devices that can be updated through hardware and software changes. You can disable signature capture if you're currently using that. Uh, do uh, pin bypass or pin suppression if you don't currently uh, do that. Um, opt for stands. There are some folks, especially in the luxury market, who like to keep the terminals behind the desk and then hand the device over to the guest as they check in. Uh, and in this world, it's probably best not to do that and uh, to put it the terminal on a stand and uh, to offer some sort of sanitization of that of that stand. There really is no silver bullet. As you can see, there's there's multiple different factors that, that come into play when you're trying to offer a no touch experience. 
So there really isn't uh, one way. Just understand that not everyone can have a total touchless environment. Um, the last block sort of touches on that and says, you know, hey, it's okay if you can't be 100% no touch, as long as you have the proper sanitization and, and or UV light devices. So the UV clean models, uh, that are available to the lodging industry for either front desk, um, behind, uh, in, in back office, or for any of the ancillary outlets. These are the devices that are, are available uh, today. There's three that are currently available in one uh, device that is actually the UV pin pad device uh, that specializes on the, the, the UV or blue light technology. Uh, that will be available uh, for, for rental or purchase in July. So these UV clean models will help with the sanitization efforts, uh, like I said before, at the front desk, in the back office, or at this, any POS outlets. And what's really nice about these is that they are PCI PADSS compliant. They also kill 99.9% .9 of the bacteria and, and virus. Um, and there's a motion sensor for cleaning after each use. So it's not reliant or you're not reliant on an employee to actually clean the device. The device is to clean themselves. So the final slide then provides some additional information on the uh, UV types, the different types of models, how to pair them with the current EMV devices that you may have, and what the availability of the technology is. So I just wanted to take this time in summary just to say we're all learning as we go, because uh, these are very unprecedented times, but there are options available to ensure guest and employee safety as, as we navigate through this time. Great, Carrie, thank you. And thank you for sponsoring this webinar. It's very appreciated, thanks. Um, thanks for having us. Started, uh, if we could go around the table, so to speak, and if everyone could just share your opinion on the general shape of the recovery or outlook on hotel financing and transactions um, bit of a loaded question, but just to provide the attendees and viewers with a little bit of context from your viewpoint. Uh, how about Rudy? We'll kick it off with you. Thank you. Um, so I'm Rudy Rydelhuber. I'm with Hodges Ward Elliott, and we are uh, hotel transaction advisors. We do a lot of work in the luxury sector, uh, transacting assets like the the St. Regis Bell Harbor or doing arranging debt and equity. We arranged debt and equity for the Ritz Carlton Key Biscayne, um, Bacar, Ritz Carlton Bacar, so a number of those types of, of properties, luxury properties. Uh, but our practice in any given year will do five to six billion dollars of transaction volume. Um, and we advise, like I said, on, on sales as well as debt and equity or, or recapitalizations and restructurings. Um, as far as the general outlook goes, um, you know, I think that what we're when we talk to our customers um, and clients like yourselves, those of you out there, we're finding that for the domestic U.S. market, and for Man Fernando may have a different view for internationally, and, and each the dynamics in each market are different. But we generally, I'd say that 60, 65 percent of the people that we're engaging with today believe that. The market will, the operating profits will return to 2019 levels around 2023. Now, the order of that and the way that that progresses will be broken down into more or less five different categories. So, low density leisure, uh, uh, like mass, luxury master plan resorts that are, you know, in, in easy to access markets. Then, high density leisure, places like Orlando, for instance. Um, then, the uh, you know, business transient customer third, fourth would be the uh, small group and fifth would be the large group. So depending on your mix of business, that 2023 recovery to 2019 levels, may you may you your curve may be sooner or your curve may be a little bit later. 
but that's generally the way that we're seeing in terms of the general outlook of, of the recovery. Right now, the um, transaction markets have ground to a halt, uh, financing markets as well in terms of individual mortgages. There is debt available at the corporate level. We saw Park Hotels issued uh, a, a lot of debt yesterday at about a 7.5% interest rate. So there is debt and equity available at the corporate level, but right now there's very little. We'll see a few transactions um, during this these, de, uh, these deferment periods, but it's going to take some time. Fernando, do you want to go next? Oh, I, you, you might be muted, Fernando. There you go. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, uh, I'm, as you said, I'm the Chief Development Officer for Playa Hotels and Resorts. Uh, Playa is a owner, operator, and developer of all-inclusive resorts. We own uh, 23, we own and operate 23 resorts, around 8,700 rooms in the main tourist destinations in Mexico, Dominican Republic, and uh, Jamaica. We have, uh, you know, affiliation and strategic alliances with two of the U.S. global brands, Hyatt and Hilton, by which we are today the only owner and operator of Hyatt's only inclusive worldwide. And uh, we are the largest owner and operator of Hilton's all inclusives in the Americas. Um, as to the uh, the questions, uh, you know, I, I agree with with um, Rudy. Um, and uh, depends, you know, depends on what's your what's your uh, customer mix, what type of operation hotel you, you're running. In our case, when you look at um, our destinations in our in our in our segment of the hotel industry in the all inclusive, we're an international uh, international market. Uh, so we depend on you know on the airlift and uh, all that we sell in a global manner. And we also we can we cater to domestic local business in some of our destinations. We depend mostly on on the international traveling coming coming back, right? So I think it's it's very uh, we're we're preparing for slow recovery, um, and I think that's what everybody needs to do: prepare for the worst and uh, hope for the best. Um, we it is very uncertain at this point when, how long this price is going to last and what kind of recovery we'll have, at least for resorts and international destinations that create in Latin America. I can say that for us to all our hotels are closed today and they're, they've, been, they've been closed since late March. And uh, although at this point we're accepting reservation across our portfolio for July, it is uncertain when, um, when and how many hotels will be, will be open. And I think the determination on when and how many properties and which properties will be based on you know government uh, local governments and then the economic viability to do so um so why government local governments i think it's we need to see in a phase one we need to see um traveling travel restrictions being eased or being lifted number one and then i think number two the phase number two will be all the players in the in the industry will need to create um you know create a campaign marketing campaigns to to send the a message to the consumers to kind of to, to to kind of generate demand and send the message that is safe to travel to our destination um i think we feel very comfortable with in, in the segment we're in because we've demonstrated in the past and downturns that uh, the all-inclusive has been a very resilient model um, the whole certainty of the budget and, and uh and the of operations that we're running i think it's always been very well received and very resilient to uh, downturns great interesting uh deborah would you like to go next Sure. I'm Deborah Friedland. I'm uh, managing director. I head up the hospitality advisory practice at Eisner Amper. Um, we're about a 1,700 person accounting and advisory firm. Um, so I, I have my hands in every hospitality um, engagement throughout the firm. Um, we service uh, domestic clients as well as international clients. Um, 
I'm touching every different um, property type and, and uh, client uh, type in terms of private equity funds to individual owners, um, to corporate owners, to REITs. Um, so it, it's definitely interesting. I've got everything from uh, budget, economy, assets to um, what I say, st six store luxury properties. Um, so it's interesting to kind of hear everybody's story. Um, my heart sank when I heard um, Rudy say um, 2023. Um, uh, my, my feeling is that it, it's going to be um, recovering. Um, we're, we'll start to see it 2021 and then uh, 2022. So I'm, I'm actually more optimistic with Rudy than Rudy, which is, uh, I think, an all time first <laughs> for me. Um, and uh, I think, look, there's so many different unknowns. This is, it's, it's so interesting because I've actually been doing this for so long and I've seen uh, the different cycles we're, we're talking about from all the way to um, the RTC days with um, savings and loans, which probably most of you on this call don't even recall, um, which was in the in the 90s, early 90s, and then to 9-11, um, and then uh, the um, Lehman Brothers collapse. So I've, I've seen it, I've seen, I've seen this before, although I have to say this time it actually is different. I mean, I, I know every time I, I talk to clients before, they're like, oh no, it's different this time. We can build it, you know, the, the performer. Every 10 years it's going to go up. And I'm like, I don't think so. But this time really is different. And there's such, you know, we always say the word un, uncertainty, unprecedented. And it really is. It's, it's just, we're seeing these occupancies in, um, Jeez, I, I'm I'm working with some hotels in Chicago that are seeing less than five percent occupancy, and it's just really un, unbelievable. And um, you know, the last couple of times in in the the downturns, um, occupancies were hovered around fifty percent level, and and now we're below twenty percent, even single digits in some markets. Um, that being said, and you know, I get I guess I'm going back. Um, I, I do think. Just looking at some of my larger group hotels, which again, I think that group demand will come back um, last. It always does. Um, I'm still seeing um, the bookings for 2022 are, are even stronger than they were in 2019. Will they hold? We don't know. Um, the big thing is vaccine, right? We get a vaccine, you know, what they say on on Wall Street is uh, risk on, right? So right now risk is on because there's chatter about a vaccine and you know uh, Powell um, was wonderful on 60 Minutes and just reassured. So it it just changes by the minute I feel. So but for me I I I I'm looking at 2022 for um, back to the 2019 um, numbers. Okay. And last but not least, Deborah, I just want to chime in. I'm more bullish than many of our customers. I, this, oh. I, would, I, would, I would definitely say that I, I agree with you. I'm very hopeful. And I think there's reasons, and we're seeing green shoots already here in Florida and the luxury properties on the West Coast that on the weekends are, some of them are already full. Again, right? right. So I can see, and I'm, I'm with you. I, I'm hopeful and very positive that 22 could be that year. But I think the majority of what I'm hearing from the psychology out there is that 23 is kind of the the median expectation. So okay, all right. I don't want to be more positive than me. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Kathy, uh, I'm Kathy Conroy. Uh, I'm the senior managing director of the consulting evaluation practice. Um, and I'm based in Miami, and so I tend to focus my practice in Florida and the Caribbean Basin. And I also serve as the uh, practice leader for our Shared Ownership Services Division. So I have to say I'm a little, I'm kind of aligned with all of the guests. <laughs> I think there's some interesting things here. I think there's the timing of the recovery, and I think there's the pattern of how the demand comes back. And I think what makes this downturn very unique and not like any others is that it uh, all the downturns in the hotel industry are usually caused by an oversupply of rooms. There have been a few instances where it was a natural decline in demand. 
but it's either a supply or demand driven um, downturn. And in this case, it was not a natural demand driven downturn. It was really created by external circumstances with a national health emergency. So that explains why we went from you know record room night demand to literally nothing in a matter of weeks, because once you take away travel and create travel restrictions, and once you uh, put shackles on business as to how they conduct commerce and, and where they have to have certain occupancy loads, you're literally shutting down the demand for the hotel industry. So there's never really been anything like this. Um, so the timing for the recovery is going, as many of the other guests said, is going to be so dependent on, you know, how the businesses reopen in the economy and the government's going to have some play in that. And also when people are comfortable getting on airlines, I think to Fernando's point and flying. Um, but the pattern of the demand and how it recovers and what Rudy said, um, I have to say that I'm spot on with Rudy. That, um, that we have data that shows the pattern of how demand recovers. And what's really exciting to me is that we're, it's happening. We're actually seeing this pattern happen. And the, um, the drive to leisure markets always come back first and they are coming back and they're coming actually pretty robustly as we're seeing in Florida now. And, um, and then the natural sequence of that pattern of demand after that is exactly what Rudy said, you know, it's, it's a regional commerce, it's the drive commerce market. Once people get comfortable with flying, then you're going to, you're going to layer in the fly to domestic market and the fly to for both business and leisure. And traditionally always last is the meeting and group business to recover. And so I think the unfortunate thing is as optimistic as we'd like to be because demand recovery is starting is there is a pattern and it's just a natural pattern and that's going to take a little time. So I have to say that I'd like to be the optimist and I am, but I'm, I, I'm with Rudy that I'm seeing 2023 and you layer in rate recovery and not just demand recovery, we could be pushed to 2023, 2024. That's mine. Okay. Okay. Well, then I guess I will ask the optimist this question, uh, Deborah. So we're hearing lots of terms get thrown about these days, such as bankruptcy, default, forbearance, covenant changes, lifelines for hotels, um, restructuring. Can you share with us a little bit what you're seeing, the costs and risks obviously associated with this downturn for existing hotels? Right. So. Um I, again, from what just talking to my clients and and some of the lenders, and um, actually taking um, working with two clients who are um, going through restructuring and have taken um, one of the client, we're planning for a bankruptcy on one of the clients, and um, so I've been through this a number of times. Um, it's um, right now. Um, it's, I, I still think we're in a bit of a honeymoon period with lenders in terms of forbearance and the, you know, I'm hearing three month forbearance thrown, thrown out there. And, you know, lenders are trying to um, work with um, their borrowers. Um, um, one of the things, a few things on the borrower's behalf is don't wait to pick up the phone um, if, you, if you're in trouble. And I'm sure many, many of the uh, folks on, on the, uh, the line now have already done so but don't wait to default to call your lender call them start a dialogue get a plan um put together some whatever you can in terms of reserves kind of um going back to what rudy said kind of plan for the worst um and shore up what you can um the cost of, of outright bankruptcy and I, uh, bankruptcy is not the norm in um the hotel space um, in, in the situations that I've been involved with. It's more of um, a, a municipality who had owned um, the hotel. So public private partnerships and um, more corporate layered into there. So it's definitely not the norm, but um, I will tell you it's extremely expensive. 
um, to get your advisors on um, to work with the attorneys um, that that help you through this. It's a massive amount of, of consultants and fees um, that go into this. It's time consuming. It's um, you know working with um, again, just from my own experience in terms of the most recent bankruptcy restructuring that we did, um, it involved a municipality, it involved a major brand. So we were negotiating with the brand, we were negotiating with these very large um, bondholders, um, the, the largest, um, the, you know, the, the names are well known. Um, we were negotiating with the restaurant operator. Um, it, it took a long time. It, it left a, uh, a shadow over the hotel um, because people who are brides, when they hear bankruptcy, they're running. I mean, that you, you say that and that's it for your um, social business. In fact, even the association. So, um, I would definitely recommend um, if if that's the situation where you see that you you have to you have no other choice for bankruptcy, um, I would definitely get an advisor who has um, hospitality expertise um, in house who's on the bench who understands how all the different parties um, work, what their goals are, how to communicate, um, how to um, put together um, a forecast of your cash. Um, needs going forward to ensure that there's a uh, cushion that you never have to do it again. Um, so I, I, I guess I just I, I, I just want to warn that it's not like a something that okay, we'll just you know declare bankruptcy, it'll be fine. It's just very difficult. it's 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 very difficult to come back from it. Um, in terms of other lifeline, um, you know we're seeing some of the brands that were able to mobilize and and recapitalize and and take advantage of. The um, debt markets, um, you know, Marriott and Hilton both did deals with credit cards. So, they're um, the the brands that are cash rich right now are providing some lifelines to some of their customers in terms of, um, you know, key money or um, you know loans, things like that. So, um, but again, uh, in that respect, I, I just you know be careful of um, the agreement that you get. Um, that you negotiate and make sure that it, it it's worth your while. Um, so I'm seeing and and just and I'll I'll finish up. But we're seeing a lot of um, where we're seeing the traditional lenders exit. You know, just say that's you know we're we're not doing this high risk. I'm I'm getting a lot of calls from private equity funds and debt funds that are um, forming and are out there looking um, just bottom fishing and and just waiting. Um, especially with all the CMBS that's coming due. Well, go ahead. Do you, do you think, Deborah, that they'll that people will have an issue refinancing at some point in the future? That the asset in general, hospitality, will be looked at differently going forward? Well, it's always a high risk, right? Hospitality is always high risk, and um, traditional lenders always they tip historically have had trouble getting their arms around it. I know that there are certain large lenders that are in um, that are very active in the space and very comfortable. Um, but I, 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 I've been speaking to a lot of lenders and owners who are just like, that's it. You know, we're we did that enough already. Like we're just not. So yes, I do. I do see a lot of more traditional um, sources of capital drying up. Okay. Interesting. Um, Rudy, I wanted to ask you too, since you're more involved on the transaction side and talking with clients, do you feel that the hotels that have suspended their operations during this uh, pandemic and for hopefully the time being actually maybe not reopening their doors ever because they'll not be able to at some point? Um, I think that's a possibility in some markets. I think some of the markets, I, I think it's going to be limited mainly to properties that were marginal in terms of equity and profitability to begin with. So if you look at a market like New York City, we do expect that there will be a lot of supply um, that doesn't come back. For instance, a small property that's also union and has F&B. In New York, it's very difficult to run union F&B profitably. So yeah, I, I think that we will see, and in New York, because of the, I mean, to Kathy's point before, usually what causes 
a problem in our industry that has supply. And New York was one of those markets that already had that before we had COVID. So I think that we'll see some, some situations where um, you'll see uh, conversions to alternative uses, you know, maybe residential or multifamily or, or things like that. Uh, not a lot, uh, actually. I don't. I don't think it'll. I think that the recovery. This kind of blindsided us. I think the recovery can also surprise us. Um, so we'll see. Good, good, good. I'm gonna try and ask only one more question that has a negative tone to it, and then we're gonna switch to positivity for the rest of the call. Um, Kathy, I wanted to find out too. Obviously, we work together with at HVS, and I know we do hundreds of appraisals and consulting work annually um valuation from a hotel standpoint they are likely changing can you give us your opinion on how valuations are changing for hotels right now um and what you're expecting to see i know you mentioned a little bit about your view of similar downturns or past downturns but how they compare with this downturn but from a valuation standpoint what are you what are you finding or seeing Sure. Uh, well, first of all, uh, the valuations are extremely challenging right at this point in time. And I think there's a couple reasons for this. You know, the basics are what is value, right? It's really the price at which a willing buyer will buy and a willing seller will sell. And what we're seeing right now is um, this gap um, in terms of what the buyer wants to pay and the seller wants to take. And so we're not seeing um, a lot of transactions happening. And that makes the valuations very challenging actually at this point in time, because at best we're really looking at kind of a range of value for different scenarios. And you have to say, well, what's causing this gap, right? In terms of the buyer and the seller. And when you look at from the buyer standpoint, they're saying, look, if I'm gonna buy this property at this point in time, then you want me to accept all the market risk of how the timing of this recovery is gonna happen, like we just talked about, and nobody can know for sure, because a lot of it, it's outside of our control. And you want me to accept all the operating risk of getting this hotel back up and running, who could be running at a negative, minimal to negative net income. And so if I'm gonna take the market risk and the operating risk at this point in time, you know, I want a big pricing discount. And, you know, it could be anywhere from 20 to 35%. And then you have sellers who are saying, well, wait a minute. I know I don't have any net income, but this is a temporary problem. It's going to go away. It's getting better each week, each month. And I'm not really motivated to sell right now if I'm going to wipe out, you know, a quarter of my asset value. And so we've got this real gap that's happening. And I think, you know, it, we'll bring Rudy into this because he's on the front lines in the transaction market. But, you know, we really don't have much of a transaction market right now because we can't find that cross point of this price discovery between the buyer and the seller. So valuations are very challenging. Um, you know, at best right now, you know, we're looking at ranges of value. I think as we march on that we'll get more clarity and we'll be able to bring those into kind of like more of a focal point but i have to make one other comment and then you know i'd like to throw this out to rudy um but what's really interesting to me is that the debt capital has really influenced this and it's a little bit to deb's point when she said she saw this honeymoon happening well never in my career have i seen the debt markets be so accommodating at this moment to borrowers. And I've seen actual, you could call it government interference or, you know, uh, government, you know, intervention, but, you know, they're putting out uh, changes in accounting rules so that the banks don't have to take the full credit loss reserve if they restructure a debt with a lender. Um, the CMBS people have found provisions where they can call something a non-transfer event and basically give a borrower six months of loan forbearance without that loan being in default yet. And so that they've taken any pressure on a seller who may not be current with their loan to be motivated to sell because they've got this runway now that could be anywhere from four to six months of breathing room for them to figure out how they're gonna recapitalize or how they're gonna get the property back and be creating some net income. 
So it's very, very interesting times, I think, right now from a value standpoint. And uh, I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, Rudy's take, because I know he's on the front lines with buyers and sellers. Yeah, so we had a full book of business coming into COVID with, you know, over 100 assignments. Most of them in this environment, the sellers have all said, don't go forward. We're not, we're, we're simply not sellers in the current environment. There have been a few, and, and, by, and, and there hasn't been enough time with the forbearances that Deborah was talking about and, you know, some of these regulatory allowances that are kind of creating four to six months of kind of, uh, uh, kind of pretend and extend time you know there's this real hope on the part of sellers and i think justifiably that that they're going to be able to get through the worst of this so we've only there there haven't been forced sales yet um kind of initiated by lenders with the exception like uh, i would say of a few markets like new york or whatnot where there was already some stress beforehand coming into this but true COVID only stress has not really led, hasn't filtered through the system yet. So in the meantime, there's only some rare, there hasn't been a lot that's come to market, but we have run processes on a couple of portfolios. And in those situations where there was, there was pressure at the corporate level, and they said maybe to free up some capital and get us some runway, we'll, we'll sell some assets. Um, we ran those processes and at the time, our sellers communicated that they would be willing to sell at about a 20% discount to the pre-corona value. The, the bids, the upper end of the bids, the most optimistic bids came in at about a 25% discount to pre-corona value. But when we initiated that process, it was at the darkest days of the equity markets. When it, the, the equity markets are now up 30%, hotel reprices are now up 100% off the bottom. So by the time that 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 those bidders at 25 kind of got almost to the to the 20% discount level, our seller was only at let's say a 15% discount. So there's still that bad ass spread. And if you ask someone like Kathy, like, well, where's what what is value today? It's usually that highest and best bidder. And today the highest and best bidder remains the seller, who's not going to you know, their view of value remains optimistic at this time. So. I just thought I'd provide that feedback as kind of real-time color commentary. So even though there aren't necessarily transactions occurring, we're seeing some bids come in and it gives us a little bit a sense of where the bid ask spread is. Sure. Fernando, do you have any input on this? Because I know you you've been involved in some recent Oh yeah, absolutely. And we I will add, I would add something else. It's like in certain markets and destinations, it's even the environment today. It makes it impossible to transact in some cases, right? Because it's like, how do you conduct tour, property tours or due diligence when government agencies are closed and uh, there's no, you know, the attorneys that you can hire in uh, Jamaica in some islands in the Caribbean to conduct due diligence, or you cannot travel and send your teams to uh, do property tours. So that's also another factor. I think. Uh, we've been fortunate enough and, and we, you know, we're very uh, happy that uh, we, I think we're the first group to transact in this environment. Uh, we announced on May 1st a, uh, that we executed a purchase sale agreement to sell two of our hotels in uh, Jamaica. Those were non-core assets um, that we were, uh, we were ready to, to, to sell them and we were fortunate enough to, to find the right buyer that could execute um in uh, in a record time so from our perspective i think there's two 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 points i would like to make one i think all hotel owners need to do a portfolio reassessment at this point i mean given given the next the next uh you know the current environment and kind of your best projection and best shot at how the recovery is going to be what capex requirements have those properties have in your portfolio kind of try try to go through the process of coming up on your own to your own re more realistic valuation because i agree with kathy and, and rudy you're at that point of the cycle where there's a huge gap between asking prices and, and what buyers will be are willing to to pay for assets uh, and you have in my region you have a lot of capital looking for deals but they're looking for distressed transactions and uh, not necessarily you have a lot of distressed companies or distressed hotels um, because I would add for my segment, for the all-inclusive, 
you have the the main players, the profile of owners is uh, is, is in the majority of them are family owned companies that learned the lessons from the prior uh, downturn and they've been delivering a lot uh, in behalf their uh, capital structure is much it's much more solid at this point so they have less debt and they can they can they can survive through this period also what you have is the regional banks and the banks that have been traditionally uh, active in our space in our region are spanish banks uh, regional and local banks mexican banks or other caribbean banks and those are banks that are focused on and they've been building long-term relationships with their customers. So right now in the short term, they've been just focused on helping them, you know, issuing lines of credit, you know, proposing then the banks proposing restructurings, deferring principal payments. So, so you have this support from these long-term uh, traditional banks. Uh, you have less in general, less amount of debt uh, of these companies. So you don't have a lot of distress. Um, situations, uh, but you have buyers looking at distress pricing. So, so that is gonna take a while. And I think as we get to know, I mean, as we get more information and we we know how this recovery is going to be, as Kathy was saying, as soon as we get more, more a better understanding of where are we up against, then I think um, the gap will be bridged. Um, okay. Do you think that there are certain like funding or sources of debt or equity that might be gone for the foreseeable future? And, or do you think there's going to be a lot of creativity going forward? Just throw it out to the group, but whoever might want to take it. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I, I think uh, that a lot of the traditional lenders in the U.S. hotel sector, you see they're already starting to pull back a little bit. And they're either exiting and the, the ones that are always in the business who are clients of ours and I talk to them and they're staying in the business, but you're going to see them start to delever a little bit, you know, where when times were good, they started to approach 70% loan to values and now they're going to drop back to 60, 65% tops, probably 60. So I think what you're going to see then is the need to get you know, more components of the equity capital stack or the debt capital stack, depending. But the mix is going to change now because the, the senior debt is going to really get a little more limited. It's going to be limited in quantity and it's going to be limited in its in its actual funding in terms of a loan to value ratio. Um, so then you're either going to have to see people trying to put in some a little piece of mezzanine debt. Uh, and then maybe some equity capital on top of that, or just more equity capital. So I think definitely the composition of the capital stack is going to be changed over the next few years from what it has been in the last few years. Yeah, we, did, we didn't uh, touch on like C CMBS, and you know, there's a huge amount of uh, loans that are going to special servicers right now. And I, you know, and I, I had. Um, I'd seen a couple of different assets where it was um, a CMBS financing and the value or the amount of debt that the owners were getting were even in excess of the value of the property based on the appraisal. I mean, I just, it was interesting. It was just a couple of months before this all hit. And um, mm -hmm. I, that just hit me, it struck me as, uh-oh, you know, here we go again. But um, here it's kind of pushed it over, this the pandemic in terms of the loans um, that were just recently um, underwritten or you know, put, put out there. Um, many of them are now um, with special service. I think two billion in uh, uh, loans went to special services over the last couple of weeks so i think it'd be interesting too if, if that just dries up as well what happens to cmbs financing in addition to the traditional lenders of the, the regional bank and whatnot um but i just i i want to also i'm going to push the point because i can't let anything go so um rudy and kathy i know that you had said about 2023 but i think that this is going to add um uh, it's going to help us rebound quicker when we don't have um, the lending, we don't have any new construction. Um, some of the construction projects that had just started may may just be, um, you know, just 
people may walk away from them. So I think that you're going to see um, this, all of a sudden you, you have this spigot shut, shut off. Um, for lending in the hospitality industry. And that, like Kathy said, it's all about supply, right? And, and as an industry, we tend to overbuild. That's what we do. We're developers, we're real estate. So I think that that would, while it's painful, will help us um, in terms of rebounding quicker. Just want to throw that out yeah. there. I agree with you, I agree with you Deb, that um... The, the, the constraints on new supply that are probably naturally going to happen now because of the lack of debt capital in the market uh, will help the recovery of rate. Of, of uh, you know, once obviously you got to recover demand first, and then you get to a certain level in your recovery of demand, and you can really start to then start to recover rate. It's just a natural sequence of the way the hotel industry works. So to your point, I agree that um, the, that lack of, of new supply is going to help kind of um, accelerate the recovery of average rate because you won't have that challenge of, of new supply threatening you. You'll just have to start recovering demand to then be able to raise rate. Sure. I think the, um, the healthiest scenario for the industry is where financing is limited on new development, um, except for just you know the best best in class type of type of new developments, but that there's a healthy financing market for refinancing existing debt and for open and operated properties. That's the that's the kind of the the Goldilocks. That's the best scenario. And what I would say is that unlike the last crisis, where we had a fundamentally unhealthy financial system, where we were coming into the downturn with properties that had 97% financing or 103% financing in some cases. And the financial, the, our financial industry itself, the banks and the corporations were, went into it un, you know, stretched. You know, this time we've got kind of, un, we're entering into this with unprecedented liquidity. So while the traditional markets for the time being for new mortgages, even for transactions are extremely limited in, from institutions, you know, we are seeing, like Deborah mentioned, these opportunity funds, private equity funds that are coming in, and they're willing to write loans. We also have a, even before this was happening, even pre-corona, our transaction volume was shifting more and more towards private family family offices that were investing in the equity in the industry. And we've been, you know, our phones are ringing off the hook with uh, private equity family offices that are also willing to maybe play in the MES or even in, in some cases play in a first mortgage per perspective, provide some bridge financing, et cetera, with the understanding that they'll be refinanced right back out in the first quarter of next year, second quarter of next year as the as the traditional institutional financing markets come back into play. The most optimistic viewpoint actually could be that there's so much equity on the sidelines that um, you know, it's it's supply and demand. It's right. It's the the supply of a lot of capital chasing limited products that are stressed. Mm -hmm. so scenario. Yeah, there, Kathy, there there was a question that came in, and I'll read it verbatim. It's it. They had asked, with so much low cost funds available or financing available, um, especially with the liquidity relief packages. Shouldn't that result in lower cap rates and higher valuations for hotel assets, despite the negative pressure on cash flows, which tend to obviously impact valuations adversely? Which of the two factors end up prevailing on hotel valuations? Well, at the end of the day, you're still buying an income stream. And you're still buying a rate of return against that income stream. And I don't. I think there's a, a a bottom of return that people are willing to accept when they're investing in a hotel asset. So I don't think we can ignore the fact that the income. So I don't see values getting higher now than they were pre-COVID right at the moment, because we have the problem of digging out of a hole with our net income, and that there is a time value of money that's factored into the return that somebody wants. So. I hope I answered that question. Yeah, uh, I think so. But I, I, as I was saying, I think you could see a scenario where um, it, things aren't that bad in terms of the drop in value because of the, the lower net incomes, it's gonna take a while to build back up because you could have a lot of capital facing the same um, deal. 
and therefore they're going to find some bottom rate of return that they're willing to go into a deal for and so that could be very helpful in terms of you may not have as much senior debt but if you have a lot of equity or equity capital that really likes a deal and they really want it you know you could get into where um that could be the optimistic scenario that we're not crashing values as much because we have competition for an asset where the capital might actually drop to the minimum they want to accept to invest in a hotel asset. And then from a luxury specific standpoint, um, do you feel that luxury hotel assets retain value? And I'm just kind of throwing out some general ideas for conversation, but do you feel that luxury specific hotels retain value more or that they have a more competitive buyer and seller market more so than your traditional limited service, full service kind of mainstream properties? Rudy, I see you shaking your head. Yes. Uh, yeah, you I, I definitely, you know, one, um, the barriers to entry for creation of new supply of true luxury product, the, 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 the barriers are great. So you have to have, you know, an A++ location uh, you have to be able to, usually there's a critical mass, like it's a, it's a big initial investment. So just um, the, the, the sheer capital barriers to entry are strong. So, I, and um, oftentimes if it's a master plan resort, I mean, those are, those are, you know, because of regulatory environments, environmentalism, et cetera, it, there's, there's other challenges to creating new, uh, new, new entrants into that space. So from a supply perspective, it's a great space. From a capital perspective, you have many players in that space that are um, not so concerned about their return, particularly if it's a property that the ownership, if it's a family that owns it and they want to enjoy it personally, you have kind of top bidders for what we call better than treasury real estate, you know, luxury spaces in urban, in urban markets that are right on a park, for instance, or, you know, just a tremendous location. Um, so we think that the scarcity value and the type of capital that, that plays in that space, that while the while the occupants, as we look, you know, RevPars have dropped more sharply in, in the luxury because those people can afford to not travel. They, 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 are, they can be privileged enough to stay at home. But we also think that when the market gets going again, that those are the, the types of properties that rebound sharply as well. Interesting. So I, I, I just want to just, I always, again, I get nervous when I hear the positive side of luxury, and I, I agree with what Rudy was saying, but I also just want to just um, caution the listeners that luxury hotels are so capital intensive. They, they are service, 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 and um, labor intensive, and, and just the, the cost to operate luxury hotels are astronomical so i just I, I think that we should just um kind of look at the you know, while, while we're saying that luxury hotels are you know, a well-located luxury hotel in you know central park in manhattan is yes that that's a trophy asset and that the value of that even if it comes down a bit will will rebound but i i just i don't want to i don't want if there's a um a investor or family office out there saying, oh, we should put our money in luxury hotels. That's, you know, Rudy said that's going to go up. I just, it's so capital intensive. And if you, it's just, it's very difficult to operate and just really need to know what you're doing and, and what you're getting involved with um, when you, you take on a luxury resort. And I, I think, Fernando, I'd love to hear, you know, your thoughts on you're in the operations and you, know, you you see firsthand what it is to to operate these you know full more full service properties with all different amenities and you know client service. So I'd love to hear what you have to say. May not Fernando. <laughs> oh, here. Okay. Oh, you muted. Okay. <laughs> yep. So I think in our space, I'm always. I'm always going to be talking about our segment, right? All inclusive resorts. Uh, in our industry, there's there's a interesting fact is that most of the competitors, most of the uh, most of the supply, are non-branded or not international branded hotels. Uh, the majority are uh, brands owned by these 
family owned hotel companies. Most of them are of, are of Spain. So they don't, they're don't. they running their hotels um, basically just depending on the intermediation of tour operators um, and OTAs, travel agents, uh, and not with brands that have the brand awareness to the level of the US global brands. Uh, so the role of Playa Hotels and Resorts or our vision um, several years ago was to the need to to introduce in our segment a new business model, a new model, which was an all-inclusive operation, which is extremely efficient in our in our markets, and it's it is well demanded by the consumer. It's a better experience. It cert gives you a certainty cost, more entertainment, more restaurants, bigger facilities, more pools. So for this crisis and this the post-COVID environment, I think we have the facilities the tools to you know to guarantee this social distancing that there's social distancing and that there's a fun experience even in this even with the considerations that we need to take right now given the crisis right but um i think in my in my segment the luxury upper upscale luxury only inclusives will outperform the market and it doesn't not only have to do with the with the quality um, of the hotel, but I think it's or the the you know the the what segment you're in, but I think is customers are going to be focused on uh, safety, quality, um, but just trust in who's the operator, who's the brand behind it, the protocols and and standards. And I think our model having the Hyatt leveraging the Hyatt in the Hilton. Uh, protocols in their standards of operations that we run as the operator. I think we're, it'll be perceived in you know, as a different and more safety um, safety hotel or resort to go to um, after we come out of the, come out of this, this crisis. Yeah. Do you think that branding in general or management contracts, even things like key money or or um capex requirements are going to shift in either a more strict or less strict way going forward after this with branding and management well, i'll jump in so with um i, I have two two um, i um argue with myself on this so on on one hand i my first instinct was that the brands were going to gain um uh power right and and just more be more valuable because um it's right now it's uh, uh gaining the the customer's trust um and brands um and i always use this example if you go to a mcdonald's in paris and you go to a mcdonald's in new york you're going to get the same french fries you know what to expect and it's just this kind of security of you know walking into a branded hotel to you know, whatever the brand that you walk into, you'll know what to expect. You'll also um, know that the brands are putting all these um, uh, policies and procedures in place for um, cleanliness and sanitation and just like very structured, um, which is so interesting too, because it when, if you look back, at, and it so happens that change happens so quickly, right? We were in this co-working communal environment of um you know it's all about experience and you know doing these exotic um trips that we just kind of like not you know just trying to get out there and just be different and now i think the the environment is um this um, flight towards safety and, and security and, and just knowing what to expect um so on, on that side I, I think that the a brand um, that customers feel that they have confidence in, that you know, the, the brand has the money to invest in all these procedures and, and protocol um, are valuable. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of my clients who are getting so frustrated with um, some of the large brands in terms of their um, dragging their feet in, in getting out different um, policies on furlough on um you know cost controls to help them forecast help the owner figure out if they should open if they should you know close if just what the new normal is going to look like what their cost structure so i think that um the 
the brands have to remember that the ownership groups are their customers and that they need to um, be responsive and, and care. You know, the customer is always right, right? In our business, the customer is always right. And I think that those brands that remember that and are you know at the forefront of making sure that the policies and procedures are taken seriously, I think those are, are the entities that are gonna do well. I think it's the brands that say, you know what, I'm, we're just doing what's good for us. Um, you know, We're having our own issues. We don't really care about our ownership group. I think that they're gonna suffer. What do you have to Everyone say about agree? that? What do you say about that, Rudy? <laughs> I agree a hundred percent. I really do. I think. We were in this era before where it was like if you had an internet, you know, the on the line online on the web, you could see a picture of the room. It didn't matter the brand, everything was moving towards independence, brands were less important, and now suddenly again, you know, that consistency of hygiene and sand, you know, is, is so important. Yeah. Great, great, great. Well, we've reached the top of the hour. Thank you guys so much for coming and chatting about this topic. I appreciate your participation. And obviously too, thanks for everyone who called in to listen or watch the webinar. Um, I would also like to remind everyone that this is a series. So the International Luxury Hotel Association will host another of these webinars on June 3rd. The conversation largely being about the customer and consumer trends, uh, drivers for consumer behavior. So all hot topics right now as things progress and and we move forward. Um, if you found the webinar to be of any value, which I hope you all did, um, please do share the recording that you'll receive with your network and encourage your colleagues to sign up for the next webinar too. Um, you'll receive this recording uh, in an email, but also it can be found on the IL IH, sorry, excuse me, ILHA, International Luxury Hotel Association's website. It's luxury hotelassociation.org. And lastly, um, encourage you to join. You, it's a great opportunity to connect with other hoteliers, leaders in the industry, able to stay on top of the trends as in this webinar it illustrates and grow your business. The ILHA is offering a reduction right now in membership fees too for professional and student members. So if you're not a member now, I would highly encourage you to look into that offer. Uh, thanks again for joining and Wishing you a, a great rest of your day. Thanks all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jill.